Please welcome Rabbi Jonah Pesner, Senior Vice President of the Union for Reform Judaism and Director of the Religious Action Center. Jessica Becker, Social Action Vice President of NIFTI. And Yolanda Savage-Narva, Incoming Vice Chair of the Commission on Social Action of the Reform Movement. Boker Tov and good morning, my Union for Reform Judaism family. You just became the first major Jewish organization or denomination to confront enduring systemic racism in the United States by calling for a study of reparations. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehachianu Vikiamanu Vehigianu Lazman Hazeh. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of the universe, who gave us life, who sustained us, and brought us to this moment of justice. Only a few short years after the founding of the United States of America, George Washington expressed in an exchange of letters with the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, the oldest synagogue in the US, the following historic statement. For happily, the government of the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it all occasions their effectual support. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of all other inhabitants while everyone, everyone shall sit in safety under their own vine and fig tree and none shall make them afraid. Now we Jews in the United States like all those who came from foreign lands, we're not blind to the injustices that existed here when we came. The inhumanity of slavery, the abysmal treatment of native peoples, and the injustice of denying women's suffrage. But we also understood the promise, the possibility of American democracy, which is why it is that 55 years ago, in the conference room, of our Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, the luminaries of the civil rights movement gathered in Washington, D.C. and drafted their contribution to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was the legislative codification of the most sacred act of a democratic society, the right to vote. And it was during that time that Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner, two young white Jews and one young black Christian, gave their lives, were murdered by the Klan because they participated in Freedom Summer as they tried to register black voters. So for all of us in the Reform Jewish movement, democracy and voting rights are as personal as they are sacred. For the last two election cycles, with the leadership and the support of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, URJ congregations and NIFTI leaders have been actively engaged in nonpartisan civic engagement work. From voter registration to candidate forums and ballot initiatives, URJ congregants have brought their deepest concerns and enduring Jewish values to bear in elections, challenging our nation to fulfill its democratic promise. So let me ask you, how many of you and your congregations were part of the 2018 Civic Engagement Campaign? <laughs> Wave your hands high if you were part of the 2018 Civic Engagement Campaign and give yourselves a round of applause because all I see is hands waving. And you had an enormous impact. Just ask Desmond Mead. 
My Florida family knows Desmond Mead. Desmond was a formerly homeless, formerly incarcerated returning citizen who in 2018 led the Second Chances campaign, challenging URJ congregations all across Florida to help pass Amendment 4, a ballot initiative that restored the right to vote to 1.4 million formerly incarcerated individuals. And that's just one example of what you did in total. Our 2018 civic engagement campaign reached 158,000 voters. We voted, we worked, we organized, we passed historic ballot initiatives that reduce gun violence, protect trans people, fund schools and housing, we built relationships with candidates, and we registered voters. And our young people made history. They joined with their peers across the United States and more than doubled the rate of college student voting. Our young people generated a 79% increase in overall voting of 18 to 29-year-olds. Let's celebrate that. And many of our young people continue to make their voices heard. Our leaders, like former NIFTY president Catherine Fleischer, who organized students at the University of Pittsburgh in the wake of the Tree of Life massacre, our students like Elias Rosenfeld, who you met yesterday, a dreamer who himself cannot vote, but who has organized others, countless others, to vote, like Zoe Turner, the former NIFTY social action vice president, who led her peers across Florida in the aftermath of the Parkland shooting, and more and more and more. Like Catherine, Elias, and Zoe, every one of us, two million reformed Jews, have a story, we have a voice, we have a reason, we have a what's at stake for us in this election. Right now, I want to turn to my colleagues to hear just two of those voices. Come November 2020, I will be voting in my first national election. But I have long known, as do my friends and colleagues in NIFTY, that whether you're old enough to vote or not, that uh, the future is too important for any of us to stay silent. Civic engagement by people of all ages is not just a right and a privilege that all of us who care about the country and the world must be a part of. Civic engagement is a responsibility. The decisions being made by elected officials are going to impact my future, my children's future, and my grandchildren's future for the rest of our lives. Will the air I breathe be clean and the water be drinkable? Will my home one day be lost to a hurricane or flooding? Will my right to make decisions about my body and my health be circumscribed to the government? Will a lawmaker I never meet decide that it's okay for me and my colleagues to be fired because of our sexual orientation or gender identity? Will my school or synagogue be the latest site of a mass shooting? The answers to these questions depend on all of us to lift up our voices, act together, and engage. Toni Morrison once wrote, we die. That may be the meaning of life. But we do language. That may be the measure of our lives. Language is so very powerful. I am very careful about the language I use because I understand the impact of words and how profoundly life-changing they can be. As a black Jewish woman who's a mother, daughter, wife, sister, and leader, words have either uplifted and inspired me or discouraged and hurt me. Both sets of words can have a tremendous impact on a person's self-worth and self-esteem over time. Words can determine whether or not you feel supported to go the extra mile or stop just shy of the finish line. 
Words can give beautiful life to a dream or kill it. The power of words is one of the reasons the 2020 election is so important to me. Words plant seeds. Entities such as social media, television, and even email germinate these seeds, add fertilizer, and are disseminated to millions of people around the world. We have witnessed all too alarmingly in recent years words used to divide and conquer, demean entire nations, and incite violence against groups of people. We must all recognize the importance of the 2020 election and how the outcome can literally be life or death for some people. The power of words. As a black person, when I hear the word shithole countries, I feel angry. As a Jew, when I hear the words Jews will not replace us, I feel afraid. As a woman, when I hear there's a threat to a woman's right to choose, I feel diminished. As a mother of a young black son, when I hear the re-emergence of the word super predator, I feel sick. As a daughter, when I hear the repeal of the ACA, I feel vulnerable. As a leader, I realize the words humanity, connection, justice, equity, safety, respect, freedom, and fairness are the words missing from the conversation. The very words that empower, inspire, and protect us are missing from the conversation. And I realize just how important the election of 2020 is, how it is absolutely critical. We do all we can to ensure the right words are heard, to make sure every voice is counted and every voice is heard. In the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Beautiful. Stay close. Okay. Stay close. Come here, Jess. Stay with me now. Stay with me now. I need you, okay? <laughs> thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Yolanda. There is no doubt how much this election matters to you and matters to you. And it matters to every person in this room and all those who are watching on the live stream. And it matters for generations yet to come. As I consider the importance of our democracy, I reflect and honor the memory of my grandma Fanny. She came to this country by herself from Russia when she was only 16 years old. She was a dreamer. She was a refugee. She was a stranger in a strange land who didn't eat, speak English and had no money. But she had the courage to make that journey after she saw the rabbi of her town in Russia drag to his death his beard tied behind a horse. When she came to America, thank God, the Statue of Liberty's light was lit and welcomed her to this country. And here my grandma Fanny found the promise of a country that gives bigotry no sanction and persecution no assistance. And as I consider the importance of our democracy, I pause and reflect on my visit to Pittsburgh with our Tree of Life family, our Squirrel Hill friends. Just hours after the tragic massacre, the worst incident of violence against Jews in American history. Thousands of us gathered in Soldiers and Sailors Hall, standing room only with countless more others outside the venue watching on flat screen TVs. And there I saw a Muslim leader stand and commit to raise all the money for the families who were impacted and commit to have Muslims stand guard outside synagogues to keep Jews safe. And there I saw a prominent black pastor who taught us three things that night. That Christian leader said, one, let us remember that this was anti-Semitism, an attack on Jews, and an attack on Jews is an attack on all of us. And second, he said, let us remember that three days ago, two black people were shot at a Kroger supermarket because the church that the shooter tried to enter was locked because of Mother Emanuel, where nine black Christians had been murdered three years before. And finally, he said, let us remember that this synagogue was targeted because it was a Hyas 
congregation, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, a congregation that was standing with refugees and migrants and strangers. And at that moment, spontaneously, thousands of people started to chant, vote, vote, vote. I understood then the lesson that my refugee grandmother's journey has taught me. Our security comes in our solidarity. Our safety comes through our democracy. This election will determine the future of our dreamers, of immigrants and refugees. This election will impact the lives of women, LGBTQ folk, and people of color. This election could declare our commitment to saving our planet, lifting people out of poverty, and ending the plague of gun violence. This election could bring a time that the prophet envisioned when all who dwell here will merit and enjoy the goodwill of all other inhabitants, and everyone shall sit in safety under their vine and fig tree and none shall make them afraid. So we ask you now, will you join us? Will you join Jessica and Yolanda and me? Will you join Catherine and Elias and Zoe? Will you join the countless souls whose future is at stake, whose lives are at risk, and who stand before us asking, what will you do at such a time as this? Will you join us?